Hello again, this is Dr. Kaiser. And in this video, I'm going to be showing you how you can use your course arc lessons, um, which are we using, of course, as the textbook for your course and can be found online on, Black, on Brightspace to prepare your, for your lecture exams. So these course arc lessons are interactive online lessons. They're content delivery systems that work very nicely, and I think you'll enjoy using it. Now, the course arc lesson that you're using as your textbook, we're going to uh, go through a typical lesson, show you how that works, the format for it, and then going to show how you can use the detailed learning objectives I provided to construct a study guide to prepare for your lecture exams. We'll also show how you can use uh, your course arc lesson to try to find answers to the think pair share questions that require a little more critical thinking and also explain how we can use the concept maps I provided as a nice way to review the material you've already learned in exam preparation. So the lesson I've chosen here is the third lecture we have in unit one, our third lecture of the semester on the peptidoglycan cell wall in bacteria. And this is the page I have loaded in. So when you click on that particular link on Brightspace, uh, the peptidoglycan cell wall in bacteria lecture, you'll come to this home page. Now, first, I'm going to go, to go through the lesson, show you the various tools that I've provided and some of the advantages of using these content delivery systems like Course Arc. Uh, and then I'm going to go back through it again, showing you how you can use the detailed learning objectives to construct a study guide, answer TPS questions. And finally, end with how we can use the concept maps to help review the material you've already learned. So this is kind of the opening page that shows you the different links that are in this particular lesson. Again, this lesson is on the peptidoglycan cell wall in bacteria. Now, again, this is the third lecture in the semester. So by the time you actually get to this lecture, uh, you would have had a lecture on prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, and of course, our lecture on the cytoplasmic membrane. So you'd be familiar with those topics coming in. So our starting point for every course art lecture and very important page are the bullet points and objectives page. So if we look at our navigation bar on the left here and we click on bullet points and objectives, I start each lesson with a series of fundamental statements. And these are like the bullet points we need to know for this particular lesson, the peptidoglycan cell wall. So these are kind of major bullet points. You want to read through those first so you become familiar with words and phrases that are in here uh, to help you uh, in preparing your study guide eventually and help you understand what you're going to be covering in this particular, so this particular course art lesson. But what you want to really concentrate on are the detailed learning objectives at the beginning of every course art lecture. And there are six of them in this one. These detailed learning objectives tell you exactly what you're responsible for on the exam from this lesson. So the best way to go about using those is to start out by writing these objectives down. And as you go through the lesson, answer them. And then once you have them answered, uh, you want to keep going over and over that material until you can basically read an objective and answer it in your mind. But you also want to make use of all the tools that are provided in this online course arc lesson. And that includes many photographs, photomicrographs, electron micrographs, illustrations, animations, uh, glossary definitions, and many other things that will help make learning easier. So I want to go through this uh, lesson first uh, to show you the way the format, the way this is set up and get you familiar with how the lessons are set up. And then we'll go through it again and show you how you can use that to answer these detailed learning objectives and also to provide clues on how to answer the think pair share questions that are often found in these lessons. And these think pair share or TPS questions require critical thinking. So you're not going to find the answer to these just by reading through this. This requires you to apply what you've learned. So you would have had to gone through the course arc lesson, studied it, and then start applying that. But I'm going to show how to make that easier by looking for keywords and then thinking about where we talked about those keywords. 
And then I'll end it by again talking about concept maps. So these are the detailed learning objectives. And uh, we'll come back to those in a few minutes. But if we just take a quick look here, we see a number of things we're looking at. You need to know the three parts of a peptidoglycan monomer. So you want to keep that in mind as we're going through. The function of peptidoglycan. How bacteria synthesize peptidoglycan, indicating the role of these four terms. Autolysins, bactoprenols, transglycosidases, transpeptidases. Describe how antibiotics like penicillins and cephalosporins affect bacteria and relate this to cell wall synthesis. State what color gram positive bacteria stain with the gram stain, gram negative bacteria stain with the gram stain, acid fast bacteria stain with an acid fast stain. That's what we need to know. Now, also notice on these objectives, some of them have a single asterisk and some have a double. That's explained here. So any objective that has an asterisk at the end, that means that is a common theme throughout the course. You have to know that all semester long. You can't forget about that after unit one. You need to know that throughout the course. Two asterisks, like we see here, that means it's usually a process we need to understand, a concept or a process. So there'll be more questions on that to show that you understand that process. So we have to know those in more depth but it's still a common theme we have to know throughout the course. So you wanna start out then by reading your fundamental statements so you have some idea of what we're gonna be covering and uh, maybe writing out the objectives so you become familiar with what you have to look for as you go through here. And again, I'll explain that in more detail later, but let's go through one of these typical course arc lessons then, the one on the peptidoglycan cell wall synthesis and see the format and how it's set up and the tools that are provided. So this lesson gets divided up into several sub-modules. We break the large topic down into several smaller topics that we all fit together to get to the lesson. And the first subtopic in this is the function of peptidoglycan, which you may remember was actually part of one of your objectives. So I'm going to kind of go through this uh, particular course arc lesson with you, use it to point out the tools I provided to help make learning easier. And I can't stress enough, make sure you're using the online version. If you print a hard copy, you can print these lessons, as you see up here, printable format, but then you don't have any of the links, any of the animations, any of the illustrations. You're not going to really understand it without that. So a couple things to notice on every page, you'll see words that are in blue showing links. And so this has an online glossary, which I made. So anytime you see one of those words, if you click on it, that's gonna bring up the definition of that word. And these are used throughout the whole course. So if you forget what peptidoglycan is later on in unit three, and you click on peptidoglycan, when you see it highlighted, then uh, that'll remind you what the definition is. So these are all definitions that you can find by clicking on them. And there's many of those throughout the course. Sometimes you'll see in that sub lesson a link. And there's quite a few of these links that are optional reviews or optional previews of course arc lessons. So for example, when we're talking about the peptidoglycan cell wall here, we also mentioned the cytoplasmic membrane and osmosis. Well, that was talked about in this course arc lecture. So if you don't remember that osmosis stuff from the previous lecture or what the cytoplasmic membrane does, then you can click on this link and that'll take you back to that course arc lesson to review. And at the end of every one of these submodules, I usually have a link to the concept map for the whole lesson. And we'll talk about that at the end of today's video. But let's start out with this then. We learned uh, that the cytoplasmic membrane of bacteria back to the previous section is surrounded by a cell wall composed of peptidoglycan. The only bacteria that don't have a cell wall are mycoplasmas but we're not concerned too much about those. But in the domain bacteria, which we learned about under the three domain system prior to this, 
uh, with few exceptions, the domain bacteria all have a semi-rigid cell wall composed of peptidoglycan. A lot of these are descriptive terms. Sometimes it helps to know some prefixes and suffixes, but glycan refers to sugars and peptido refers to peptides, short chains of amino acids. So these are often descriptive terms. So the function of peptidoglycan, it simply prevents osmotic lysis. That's bursting due to osmotic pressure. And this relates back to what we learned under the cytoplasmic membrane in the previous course art lesson. Bacteria concentrate nutrients or solute through active transport. So there's more solute, less water inside the bacteria than outside. So the bacterium cyto a cytoplasm is hypertonic to the hypotonic environment. And in that environment, as you learned under osmosis, water flows into the bacterium. Well, if this bacterium didn't have a cell wall, as water flowed into the uh, cell, it would swell like a balloon being filled with water with its cytoplasmic membrane until it burst. So bacteria need a peptidoglycan cell wall so they don't burst under normal growth conditions because normally they live in a hypotonic environment because they're concentrating nutrients inside the cell. And that causes water to flow in. So as water flows in, the membrane begins to swell until it hits the cell wall. But the cell wall creates a back pressure or trigger pressure that prevents the bacteria from bursting. So that's critical structure. Without that cell wall of peptidoglycan, the bacteria would burst under normal growth conditions since they live in a hypotonic environment. So once you get through that little page, and that submodule is just real short. It just basically deals with the function. Then we move on to the next one. Now they're listed here under navigation on the left, but the easiest way to get to the next page is at the bottom, you can just click on that. So our next submodule is structure and composition of peptidoglycan. And this relates to part of one of the objectives too that asks you for the three parts of a peptidoglycan monomer. So peptidoglycan consists of interlocking chains of identical peptidoglycan monomers. So a peptidoglycan monomer is the building block of peptidoglycan, just like uh, a nucleotide is a building block of DNA or RNA. And a peptidoglycan monomer consists of three parts, two joined amino sugars, they have long names, and acetyl glucosamine and acetyl ceramic acid, but we call them NAG and NAB for short. And off of the NAB sugar are five amino acids, a pentapeptide. Remember, a peptide is a short chain of amino acids. So down here, we see a flip card activity that shows you the peptidoglycan monomer. This is the building block for peptidoglycan. Two sugars, NAG and NAM. Coming off the NAM are five amino acids, a pentapeptide. <coughs> Excuse me. And if it's a flip card, you can uh, flip over and see a description of that. And there's another one. Now, these building blocks or monomers join together to form chains. So as we set up here, it's a chain of peptidoglycan monomers. So in this particular illustration here, here's a peptidoglycan monomer, the building block of the cell wall. So here's one monomer, which connects to the next monomer, which connects to the next monomer, and you get this long row of sugars. But then each row is connected to another row by what we call peptide crosslinks, where a chain of amino acids will hook the peptides coming off of one NAM with the peptides coming off of a NAM in the next row. And this is what connects one layer of peptidoglycan with another, one row of peptidoglycan with another. And this is what gives it the appearance of kind of a molecular chain link fence. It's a very strong, but very porous substance. So we see that the peptidoglycan is made of peptidoglycan monomers. They hook together to form rows. Each row connects with the next row, the next layer, with these peptide crosslinks. 
And these monomers are made inside the bacterium. They're synthesized in the liquid part of the cytoplasm or cytosol. And then a transport carrier, a transport protein called bactoprenol, assembles the monomer and transports that monomer across the membrane so it can be inserted into the growing cell wall. So what we're going to be getting at here is that bacteria are surrounded by what is basically a molecular chain link fence. It looks like this up here in this flashcard. It's very porous but very strong. So you can picture as each monomer is being a link in a chain and each uh, chain in that chain link fence connects to the one adjacent to it, the one above it, and the one below it. And that makes it very strong. So the monomers are made by the bacterium. They attach to bactoprenol, which we'll see in the next section. And that transports them across the membrane where they can be inserted into the growing cell wall. Now we learned that bacteria divide by binary fission, they split in two. So when a bacterium divides, it's half its normal size. So to grow, it's going to have to put breaks in its cell wall so it can insert new building blocks to get bigger. That's all part of binary fission. And there'll be various enzymes involved in that as we'll see in the next section too. So what connects one monomer with the next monomer to form a row are called glycosidic bonds. These are bonds between sugars. Glyco means sugars. So it's connecting this sugar, the nag, with the nam of the next one, the nag of that with the nam of the next one, et cetera. And then these long sugar chains, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which we see here get connected to one another by peptide cross links, where a short peptide or chain of amino acids connects one row with the next row, that row with the next row, that row with the next row, and also one layer with the next layer, et cetera. And I've also included a little animation from YouTube on peptidoglycan if you want to watch that. Now notice that this submodule on the structure and composition of peptidoglycan has its own self quiz at the end. So once you finish one of these submodules, if there is a self quiz, try answering it. See how well you understand that. If you get them right, then you probably have a pretty good idea of what's there. If you don't, go through and read it again. So uh, if we take a look at just this first one as an illustration, the function of peptidoglycan crosslinks and peptidoglycan. Well, we just said that connects one row of peptidoglycan monomers with the next row, one layer with the next layer. Composed of NAM, NAG, and a pentapeptide. What does that describe? Well, that we said was a peptidoglycan monomer. So if you chose those and could submit, it would tell you, hey, you got them correct. If you didn't read that, you figured I'll just go through click answers till I find the right one, that's not gonna work as good. So if we try again, and you're just kind of randomly choosing answers. Then, of course, it tells you, well, you didn't get them right. So it's useful to do these self quizzes because they let you know if you're understanding that. But your lecture exam is not just these questions, obviously. You have all the questions in advance. So there could be, out of, say, 75 questions on a lecture exam, there might be 15 or 20 that are all in the self quizzes here, but the rest aren't. So again, this is just a way to kind of quiz yourself to see if I have a pretty good understanding of this section by using a couple of random questions as a tool. So once you understand what peptidoglycan is composed of, <coughs> excuse me for coughing, I'm getting used to talking for long periods of time again after a couple months off. We move on to the next submodule, which is actually the synthesis of peptidoglycan. So that would be this topic here in the navigation, the next one down. But again, the quickest way is just to click the next page. Now, this one has a double asterisk question on it because there's a lot of stuff you have to know here. You have to understand how bacteria synthesize peptidoglycan and the function of several important enzymes and a transport protein which is actually part of one of your objectives, as you can see. 
So this reminds you that for bacteria to increase, uh, that divide by binary fission to increase in size, they have to put links, the links in the peptidoglycan have to be broken. New peptidoglycan monomers have to be inserted and it all has to be connected again. So it's doing this constantly to grow as it divides. So first there are enzymes called autolysins. And again, sometimes if you, um, Think a little bit about the terms they help you. It also helps to know some suffixes and prefixes. But lice means to split or break. Auto means self. So this is an enzyme that the bacterium uses to break its own cell wall down. But it's doing that so it can insert new monomers. So it has to break the glycosidic bonds between the sugars in the row. These guys right here that we see in this flashcard the stuff that connects one monomer with the next monomer, the glycosidic bonds, those have to be broken with an autolysin. But also these peptide crosslinks between the rows have to be broken. And that's done by autolysins. But the best way to follow that is use the animations that I've provided. I've made over 200 animations that uh, help you follow what's going on here. And this is going to be a fairly long video because I'm actually going through a lecture unit to show you how it's set up, but also how you can use that then to prepare your study guide. So it requires you at least seeing where the material is. So the first thing that has to happen if the bacterium is going to grow is it has to break these bonds between the monomers. Remember, that's a monomer right here, magnam peptide has to break the bonds between the monomers, the glycosidic bonds with one autolysin, but it also has to break these peptide crosslinks that connect one row with the next row, giving it that molecular chain links concept. So autolysins are going to break the glycosidic bonds, like the green one's doing here, and this one's breaking the peptide crosslinks, and that creates a molecular gap where a new monomer can be inserted for the bacterium to grow. Now, of course, this is growing all around the bacterium. This is happening uh, constantly throughout the bacterium as it divides. So it's inserting these raw, raw materials. So that's the first thing. You have to uh, break the cell wall in order to insert new building blocks to grow, like adding bricks to a brick wall or new links to a chain link fence. And there's uh, uh, nice descriptions of the animations you go through too. Now, meanwhile, the building blocks, the monomers have to be synthesized in the cytoplasm and they have to bind to the transport protein bactoprenol. So in the previous course arc lesson on the cytoplasmic membrane, you learned about active transport, which involves energy and transport proteins to transport things across the membrane. But these are actually transporting things from inside to outside because that's where the cell wall is outside the cell. So what's going to happen is this bactoprenol here is a transport protein in the membrane. The monomer is going to assemble on the bactoprenol and it's going to transport them across the membrane from the inside to the outside so the monomers can be inserted into the growing cell wall here. And it's easier to follow that with the animation. So there's our bactoprenol. There's the gap that was created by the autolysins. Uh, so first, NAM is attached to the bactoprenol. The UDPs are energy compounds, kind of like ATP. They're going to provide the energy for the bond to form. But first, the NAM uh, attaches its five amino acids, its pentapeptide. Then the NAM is attached to bactoprenol and NAG's attached to the NAM, and now the monomer is assembled. Bactoprenol transports that across the membrane and gets recycled and starts assembling another monomer. But again, these are occurring all around the growth area. So it assembles the monomer and transports it across the membrane. Now, it doesn't actually leave the membrane. It actually just flips down and dumps it in, but that's too hard to show in an animation. So now the bactoprenol has assembled the monomer, it's transported across the membrane, but it doesn't hook them together. These are just kind of sitting there. So next, it all has to get resealed. 
So next, transglycosylase enzymes are going to link the new peptidoglycan monomers into the break in the peptidoglycan. They're going to add the monomer to the row here. So these are the glycosidic bonds that are going to form that hooks one sugar to another sugar. And the enzyme for that is transglycosylase. So again, ACE is an enzyme. Glyco refers to sugar. So this is going to connect the sugars together. If you're trying to remember which does what. And we see that in this animation. Let's label everything. Okay, so there's the monomers that have been assembled on bactoprenol, transported across the membrane. Transglycosylase is going to form glycosidic bonds, bonds between sugars, glyco. It's going to connect magnanam there and magnanam there. So there's the transglycosylase inserting the monomer into the row, making the row longer. That's its job. But the peptide crosslinks still have formed, so that takes another enzyme called transpeptidase. So ACE is an enzyme, but this has to do with peptides, transpeptidase. So it's going to form a peptide crosslink. So again, that helps you remember what does what. And we'll see that happening in the last animation here. Okay, so the monomers have been assembled, transported across the membrane. Transglycosylases have connected the monomer into the row, there and there. So now transpeptidase is going to form these peptide crosslinks. And during that process, one of the five amino acids comes off, which you don't have to know, but that's providing energy. So here comes transpeptidase, and its job is to take several amino acids and connect the peptide on one NAM with the peptide on a NAM in an adjacent row or layer. And that forms the peptide crosslinks, which create the uh, molecular chain link fence. And the wall is again, once again, resealed and strong. So the bacteria doing this constantly as it's growing. It has to break the cell wall, assemble new building blocks, transport them across the membrane, and connect them all together connect the monomers to the row, connect one row to another row with peptide crosslinks. And in electron micrograph, we see that the cell wall here, this is the peptidoglycan cell wall, lies outside of the cytoplasmic membrane. That's a figure you also looked at in a previous section. And this summarizes the whole thing from beginning to end. And as we're going to see a little later on, there's also some TPS questions on this section. And again, we have a self quiz. In this case, you're going to drag the choices so the terms match the descriptions here. And then you can click to see if you're right. If you're not right, you can try again to get them right. But again, if you go through and understand this section, you should be able to drag these with their descriptions pretty easily. So now we know how the peptidoglycan is synthesized. And one of the reasons we need to understand that is that some of our antibiotics inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis causing the bacteria to burst from osmotic lysis, our next topic. So we have a pretty good number of antibiotics that inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis. And of course, since that prevents osmotic lysis, if they interfere with peptidoglycan synthesis, you have a weak cell wall and they burst from osmotic lysis, bursting due to osmotic pressure, because remember, in a hypotonic environment, water flows into the bacterium. Well, what the penicillins and cephalosporins do, they bind to the enzyme transpeptidase. Now, remember, that's the enzyme that forms the peptide crosslinks between the rows of sugars. And so this animation illustrates how that would work. And in unit two, we're going to get into the different ways antibiotics work, what they interfere with in bacteria. But this is kind of a preview that you should be able to think out based on, so we'll understand it better when we get there. So remember, during cell wall synthesis, the last step is that transpeptidase is going to form, hook up a series of amino acids to connect one row with another row. 
We call these peptide crosslinks, where these amino acids inserted by transpeptidase connect one row to another to make the wall strong. So this is what transpeptidase normally does. It forms peptide crosslinks to finish the resealing. But the penicillins and cephalosporins bind to transpeptidase. And once the drug binds to the enzyme, that inactivates the enzyme so that it can't form peptide crosslinks. So now, although the monomers are inserted, the peptide crosslinks don't form. So that's creating a weak spot. And as the auto license continue to put breaks in the cell wall, but the peptide crosslinks don't form, the wall becomes weak. And as the water causes the membrane to swell, the bacteria bursts from osmotic lysis. And that's a link to a movie that actually shows you bacteria bursting. You can actually see the membrane swelling out and popping. And again, we have another one of these links. Uh, this is where we take up how antibiotics work. So if you were curious about that and wanted to preview that course arc lesson, you can do that. But again, all of those links are optional that you see there. And again, we have a link to the uh, concept map, which we'll get to in a little bit. Now, the last part of this particular lesson deals with gram-positive, gram-negative, and acid-fast bacteria. That's our final topic here. So uh, we can divide most bacteria into one of two groups based on a stain called the Gram stain developed by Christian Gram in the late 1800s. And he found with this four-step uh, staining procedure that you will learn in lab six, that bacteria stain either purple or pink. And so it was decided that if they stain purple, when you do a Gram stain, meaning they retain the first dye you use, crystal violet, so it's actually violet, uh, they're, we'll call them Gram positive. But if in the same staining procedure, they lose the crystal violet and pick up a second stain, safranin, which is pink, then they stain pink. So quite simply, gram-positive bacteria are those that stain purple during a gram stain, gram-negative stain pink during a gram stain. And again, we'll do gram stains in unit six, one of the fundamental tools in beginning to identify bacteria. And we'll learn why they stain differently in a later so, uh, course arc lesson. Now, there's a group of bacteria that cause tuberculosis and a few other diseases called mycobacterium, and they just don't stain well at all with the Gram stain. <clears throat> but another stain was developed called the acid fast stain. And so, acid fast bacteria resist decolorization with a mixture of acid and alcohol, and they retain the first dye in the staining procedure called carbofuxin, which is a fuchsia or reddish color. So acid fast bacteria stain a reddish color, as we see here, uh, when you do an acid fast stain. And this is an acid fast stain of sputum with a person with tuberculosis. Virtually all other bacteria lose the red dye and pick up the blue counter stain, like these normal flora in the mouth here, or the mucus. But the acid bacteria retain the red dye. And we'll be talking about the three different cell walls in upcoming course art lectures. And there's a little self quiz then on gram positive, gram negative, and acid fast bacteria. And then at the very end of this lesson, the very last thing is a self quiz covering the entire lesson. So this self quiz covers all of these sub modules. So you can go through and try the self quiz, see how you're doing there. I put in one or two identification questions to help you practice. And that would be the end of that lesson. And you go back to the table of contents on Brightspace and move on to the next. So anyway, I did actually go through that lesson with you. So you'd kind of learn where stuff is for this next part. And that's how to answer the detailed learning objectives. So let's go back to our bullet points and objectives. And notice the first one has two parts. State the three parts of a peptidoglycan monomer state the function of peptidoglycan and bacteria. So if we go to our navigation, well, where did we talk about the composition of peptidoglycan was composed of? Structure and composition. So if we click on that one, we see that a peptidoglycan monitor consists of two amino sugars, mag and mab, with a pentapeptide coming off. So there's your answer to that one. 
two amino sugars, NAG and NAM, with a pe petapeptide coming off the NAM. That is the building block for peptidoglycan. What is its function? The other part of that objective, we click on function. And of course, we learn there that it helps to prevent osmotic lysis. And it does that in a hypotonic environment. So you have to understand osmosis from the previous course arc lesson where that was covered. The idea that because bacteria concentrate nutrients or solute, there's going to be more solute, less water inside the cell than outside. The environment will be hypotonic to the cytoplasm. And in that environment, water flows into the bacteria. So the cell wall prevents osmotic lysis. Water normally flows into a bacterial cell because of its normal living conditions. Without that cell wall, it would burst from osmotic lysis. Moving on to the next objective. Uh, briefly describe how antibiotics, oops, wrong one. Briefly describe how bacteria synthesize peptidoglycan, specifically indicating the role of autolysins, mactoprenols, transglycosylases, transpeptidases, a double asterisk one that will probably have several questions. So where did we talk about synthesis of peptidoglycan? Well, under synthesis of peptidoglycan. So we go to that submodule. And here we see what the auto license do as we went through there and the animation that illustrates what the auto license do. What the bactoprenol does, that it assembles peptidoglycan monomers and transports them across the membrane so they can be inserted into the existing peptidoglycan. And there's the animation that showed it doing its job. Once the monomers are inserted, the monomers have to be inserted into the row of sugars, connecting one monomer with the next monomer. That's done by the bond that connects sugars together, transglycosylases. And there's the animation that showed what the transglycosylases do. And finally, each row has to be connected to the next row by peptide crosslinks. That's done by transpeptidase. And there's the animation that showed how those form. So again, once you've gone through this and you look at the objective, you can pretty easily find where it is, go there and find the answer pretty easily. And then also make note that there might be a good animation or an illustration to help you remember that. So you're not just memorizing a bunch of words, but you're visualizing a process. <clears throat> Moving on to the next objective. Uh, briefly describe how antibiotics like penicillin and cephalosporins and vancomycin affect bacteria and relate it to their cell wall synthesis. Well, when we talk about antibiotics, of course, right here, antimicrobial agents that inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis. And here we saw that penicillin and cephalosporins bind to transpeptidase, the enzyme that forms the peptide crosslinks resulting in a weak cell wall and osmotic lysis. That's how they kill. And there's the animation we showed of how penicillin inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis, causing osmotic lysis. And then finally, uh, we have state what color gram positive and gram negative bacteria stain with the gram stain and acid fast bacteria stain with the acid fast stain. So obviously, we go there gram positive, gram negative, acid fast stain. Gram positive stain purple in a gram stain, gram negative stain pink in a gram stain, acid fast bacteria stain red in an acid fast stain. And there you've answered all the objectives. Now it leads us finally to the think pair share questions that require a little more critical thinking and require you to understand this material before you can answer them. So this says that the antibiotic bacitracin, often found in the triple antibiotic creams you can buy at the drugstore to put on cuts, binds to bactoprenol. How does that lead to death of the bacteria? So we, what we want to do here then is think of key words, bactoprenol. It says the drug binds to bactoprenol. So what does bactoprenol do for the bacteria? What'll happen if that compound doesn't work because the drug's bound to it? 
Well, where did we talk about bactoprenol under synthesis of peptidoglycan? And there we remind you what peptidoglycan does. So it's going to assemble the monomers. It's going to transport them across the membrane. So what's going to happen if an antibiotic binds to bactoprenol? If the drug binds to this bactoprenol, it's not going to work anymore. It's been altered. It doesn't have the right shape to carry out its function. So first of all, the monomers have nothing to assemble to, so no monomers are made. And of course, if no monomers are made and bactoprenol doesn't work, no monomers are transported across the membrane. So although the autolysins are splitting the cell wall, there's new, no new monomers come in to be inserted so the bacteria can grow. And as a result, you're going to have a weak cell wall and the bacteria, again, are going to burst from osmotic lysis. So again, look at it kind of logically. What does bactoprenol do? What what's going to happen to the bacteria if that molecule doesn't function? Moving on to the next part of that think pair share question. Uh, penicillin binds to transpeptidase, explain that, how that leads to death. And could this antibiotic be used to treat protozoan infections like giardiasis and toxoplasmosis? Kind of two parts of that. Well, actually, we had an animation that showed you that. So uh, what's the key word? The drug binds to transpeptidase. Where did we call it? talk about transpeptidase under synthesis of peptidoglycan? So uh, you can go there and see what transpeptidase does. And of course, that's the enzyme that forms the peptide crosslinks, connects one row with another row. So if that doesn't work, then uh, you're going to have a weak cell wall as water flows in. It's going to burst from osmotic lysis. And in fact, we actually showed you an animation of how that works in the next section, how penicillin works. So we had an animation on that one as well. And that's this animation that shows you how penicillin inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis and shows you the osmotic lysis occurring. And then the last part of that question requires you to remember something you learned from the first lecture on prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Could this antibiotic be used to treat protozoan infections like giardiasis and toxoplasmosis? Well, under pro and eukaryotic cells, we learned that only bacteria are prokaryotic and only prokaryotic cells in the domain bacteria have peptidoglycan as a cell wall. So that's found only in bacteria. We also learned that protozoans are eukaryotic cells, not prokaryotic. And we learned that eukaryotic cells never have peptidoglycan. That's found only in bacteria. And in fact, we also learned there that protozoans don't even have a cell wall. They're surrounded just by a cytoplasmic membrane like human cells are. So there'd be nothing for that drug, uh, that drug, transpeptid, or that drug penicillin to bind to there'd be no transpeptidase in protozoa because they don't make peptidoglycan. They don't need it. That's why it doesn't hurt, hurt our cells. We don't have peptidoglycan. That's why it doesn't work on viruses. Viruses aren't even cells, as we learned under pro and eukaryotic. So they have nothing for the drug to bind to. So by searching for keywords in the think pair share question and going back over the section where we talked about that keyword, that will give you a pretty good idea of how to answer the think pair share questions. And the last thing I want to talk about are the concept maps. So uh, for every lab exercise in your lab manual and every almost every course arc lesson in your course arc lecture lessons, uh, there's a concept map or mind map that summarizes all the key points in that lesson in a very visual way. So these are very good for reviewing material once you've learned it. It can also help you to learn the material. So if we click on the concept maps, always look for that. I put it in larger face so you know that there is a concept map to look at. This is the concept map for this lesson, the peptidoglycan cell wall. And as you see here, pretty much everything that was in the objectives is laid out 
very visually for you here. The topic is peptidoglycan. The function of peptidoglycan is to prevent osmotic lysis. Uh, peptidoglycan consists of interlocking chains of peptidoglycan monomers connected by peptide crosslinks. A peptidoglycan monomer consists of two sugars, NAM and NAG, with a pentapeptide coming out. So that was one of your objectives. And whenever you see a box and you click on it, that will take you to the picture where that was covered. So NAG, NAM, pentapeptide. And then uh, these long rows of sugars are joined to one another by peptide crosslinks that make it like a molecular chain link fence. So there's the diagram showing you how the rows of peptidoglycan monomers are connected to one another by peptide crosslinks. So that's what peptidoglycan is composed of. Uh, this is how peptidoglycan is synthesized. Autolysins will break the glycosidic bonds between the peptidoglycan monomers and the peptide uh, crosslink bridges to create a space for adding monomers. And there's a link to the animation that shows you how autolysins work. Meanwhile, bactoprenols assemble the peptidoglycan monomers, transport them across the membrane so they can be inserted into the cell wall. And there's the animation that shows you how that works. Then transglycosylases, they're also called transglycosidases sometimes, uh, they're going to hook the monomers into the row of uh, monomers to make the row longer by forming glycosidic bonds between the sugars. There's the animation that does that. And finally, transpeptidases form the peptide crosslinks, uh, which connects one row to another row. And there's an animation of that. And finally, an animation that summarizes the whole process. So as you see, we have pretty much all of our objectives answered. Up here, we have, with the exception of mycoplasmas, all bacteria in the domain bacteria have a cell wall of peptidoglycan. We divide them in three groups, gram-positive, which stain purple with a gram stain, gram-negative, which stain pink with a gram stain, and acid-fast bacteria that stain red with an acid-fast stain. So you see pretty much all the stuff that was in the objectives is presented there in a nice little diagrammatic form with nice key pictures. So these don't print out well, but they work great online. And again, I would urge you to be using these to be reviewing the material, because once you write it down, you have to learn it. You have to keep going over it and over again until you learn it. But once you have it down, uh, have learned somewhat, then you can use this as a nice way to review that and quickly look at pictures to remind you what that looks like. So that is a rather lengthy video, uh, but I wanted to go through that in some detail to show you how each of these course arc lessons are set up, the tools that are provided, like the glossary terms, lots of illustrations, animations, photographs, electron micrographs, uh, YouTube video links, and uh, then, of course, your detailed learning objectives that tell you exactly what you're responsible for. Um, and also some nice bullet points at the beginning to let you know what we're talking about in that lecture. So that's how to use your course arc lessons, and I hope you found that useful. Take care.